Okay, picking right back up where we left off, just so that everybody can get a little break in there if you need a break. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk just a little bit about the book and what's going on with it, so you'll be prepared for your next homework. Um, you I want you to recall that um, algebra is, at its core, just a series of patterns. So... Um, we're going to do a lot of patterning here. So I want you to see that. We're going to do a little bit of patterns right off the bat um, as soon as we get a little bit of notes. So as you read through your text, um, there are some things in there about asking classroom questions. So they want to get students to think algebraically. And what that means is that we need kids to start thinking about patterns. And we need kids to start generalizing from those patterns. We need kids to start making rules using, it can be concrete, it can be pictures, or it can just be their regular old algebra. But we need them to start making rules to talk about functions. In order for that to happen, in order for our kids to be able to do this, our teachers have to be able to do this. So that's where you guys get a little bit of fun working through stuff. So we're going to do some patterning. It'll be the rest of this week and all of next week. You're going to be doing sequences and series and patterns. And you're going to get so stinking tired of it. And I'm sorry, but uh, it'll be really good for you. Okay. So in your book, they talk about asking classroom questions. Um, I want to make sure that you have read the book and you start looking through that stuff. And one of the things that they say is that you need to make sure that you're consistent in your modeling of the algebraic thinking. So you need to be consistent. Okay. Um, and a lot of times this will mean that you have to have students try the patterns in various forms. So they can do a certain pattern with the two color counters that I've shown you. They can do it with color tiles. They can work it using pictures or whatever. But no matter what, they should be able to model the same kind of situation in lots of different ways um, that will foster that algebraic reasoning, which is what we're wanting to. Okay? You should be able to give well-timed pointers Timed. Well timed pointers. Okay. And what that means is I'm not standing over your shoulder all the time telling you what to do, but my purpose here is to shift your focus. I should say their focus. To shift the student's focus so that they will think about what I want them to do. Okay. Think about things from a different angle, maybe, or whatever. Don't stress out if they're not seeing it, the, the pattern, using um, just whatever one manipulative. Try it in a different way. So maybe I can give them a pointer and say, hey, did you think about doing things this way? And then you should ask a variety of questions that are aimed at helping the students organize their thinking. So variety of questions. to help them organize their thinking. So again, helping them focus a little bit, but sometimes to help them focus means that they might just be all over the page, so maybe we need to give them something. Oh, did you think about putting that in a table? Oh, maybe, what, if, what happens if we just do con consecutive numbers instead of kind of being all over the page? So those are some of the basic tenets that are in your book about making sure that you're doing these things as you ask questions and that's in the classroom. I think I said that but I didn't write it down. But asking questions in the classroom. And then two things you need to keep in mind when you're asking questions. Two key points. Um, and your book really goes into depth about these. The first one is what's the intention of what's happening 
Um, do you mean to, what do you mean to do with something? What's going on in the problem? And the second one is what's the context? So what's going on around the questioning? What's going on around what they're working on? So basically there are five categories of teachers' questions. And again, read your book. I'm just hitting on the highlights. So you need to get in there and make sure that you uh, know exactly what the book says. By the way, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I was thinking, you know, if you've ever had me in a class before, every once in a while, as I go along, I just get these, like, cool breezes that blow over my arms or down my back. It just kind of, ooh, oh my gosh, did you feel that? There's a shift in the weather pattern. There's something coming our way. And when I feel that way, a lot of times, right after I feel that little shiver go down my back, lo and behold, there's a quiz. Yep, I know. Oh, Dr. Webster, don't do this to us. Yeah, so, you know, I felt that little shiver run down my back earlier today, and I thought, oh, man, I wonder if there's a quiz on the horizon. So maybe make sure you've read this stuff because maybe you might have a quiz coming up. I don't know. Sometimes I'm wrong, but normally I'm probably pretty right about that. Oh, I can't write. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, because I was thinking about the quiz that I felt coming. Okay, number one, managing type questions. You're just getting students on track. Okay, Susie, you know, you're kind of uh, off in left field. Let's, let's get back to the math here. Let's think about what's going on. So there's just managing type questions. Did you think about this? Have you, have you paid attention to that? Whatever those are. Okay, sometimes they're clarifying questions. And I know, usually we clarify things with a statement. But sometimes... You don't have to, to clarify with a statement. Sometimes you can ask a question. So usually that's getting information from the students. Okay. So, oh, where are they in their process? What are they looking at? So a lot of times when the teacher isn't sure what the student was planning to do, why they're bothering to, I don't know, build a huge fort or whatever whenever we're just talking about toothpick houses so what are the students intentions why are they doing that what's their plan what what the heck is going on okay the third type can be orienting orienting questions okay so it keeps students thinking about the right thing keeps them on track Don't let them veer too far off the path. You know, sometimes we have to go down a rabbit hole just because, you know, we were thinking about a particular whatever and something else came up and, oh, my gosh, you know, it took me down that rabbit hole. But if, if we can stop students before they get too, down, too far down that rabbit hole, sometimes it's good for them. So not to go too far down that rabbit hole. So maybe we need to orient them. Okay. Prompting mathematical reflection. This one's in your book again. So prompting the mathematical reflection. So what I'm doing here is I'm asking students to think about whatever topic it is and explain themselves. Ask students to think about the topic and explain and usually that ends up being a why. Why did you do that? That helps them to think more deeply, more richly about the mathematics that's going on. So they're actually doing a little bit of reflection there and that's one of the things we want them to do. And then the last thing, the last type of questioning that your book talks about is the questions that elicit al algebraic thinking. OK, 
Okay, eliciting algebraic thinking. So what that means is that I'm going to ask my students, hey, can you do those algebraic habits of mine? So can you do or undo? Do or undo? Or can you recognize a pattern? Or can you develop a rule? So on and so forth. So we're actually really, 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 really um, focusing them in on the math and the algebraic thinking that I want them to do. Okay, so those are all in your book. You can read way more in depth. They have examples and stuff like that. But those are the five types of algebraic questions, questioning habits. That, uh, that the book talks about. And those are going to come in handy when you do your questions about the book, chapter one. So go through and look at that. Okay, so once more, just to remind you, the algebraic habits of mind, you can go through and look. Doing and undoing, building rules to represent functions, and abstracting from computations. So can you take things and um, make them really... Okay, we were doing computations, but now we're going to make them really abstract or broad. Generalize. Okay, so here's some activities. Activities used to teach habits of mind. And these are all algebraic, of course. Okay, some of those habits. The first thing, like I said, doing and undoing. What is something I might have students do or undo? There are some techniques that we actually teach you in the Math 350 and 351 classes. So something that really, really gets at doing and undoing. Yep, working backwards. That is clearly the definition of doing and undoing, right? Because I'm working backwards to undo something. Another thing that could do that is, um, like I mentioned with the locker problem with the new function, can I get the input from the output? If you can get the input from the output, then that tells me you could have undone something. So that's always a good thing if you can do that kind of stuff. All right, number two, building rules to represent a function. Functions. Building rules to represent functions. What are some types of things that we might have to do, the activities we're going to do in class that are going to help students build rules um, and represent functions. Well, I mentioned a second ago, maybe they need to organize themselves. So maybe organizing activities um, where I take information, I put it into a table, or maybe I um, chart things or whatever. Organizing might be helpful. Predicting a pattern. I can't make a rule until I see what the pattern is. So maybe we need to spend a lot of time with students predicting patterns. And that's something that you're going to do in some of these um, activities I'm going to make you do. So predicting a pattern is a big thing. Maybe I need to chunk the information. It's an interesting word that they use in the book. Chunk the information. What does that mean, chunking the information? It means maybe I can look at things and cluster the information together around a similar pattern or whatever. Um, you saw that in the number, divisors, number of divisors homework that I gave from day one of this week. So they have things chunked together. All of these things have just a prime number times a prime number. All of these things in set whatever, maybe it was set C, have a prime number times a prime number squared. So they're chunking things together and sticking it all together so that you can see a pattern more easily inside of that smaller amount of, of material. Okay, um, Maybe we need to describe a rule. 
like in words? Can we tell people what is going on when we see the pattern? Maybe we need to describe the change that we're seeing. Okay, what happened from the first picture to the second picture? And we're going to get some examples here in a minute. So what's happening in there? Can I see the change that's going on? And maybe I might need to use different representations. So sometimes it helps me to think algebraically if I can see stuff Maybe it's all in a bar chart and I need to see it all in a line graph or maybe I can put it all in a histogram or something like that. So different representations will help sometimes. And a really big one would be if I can justify my rule. And that's really important to students because they want to know why does something work. If you don't know why, like the divisibility for three rule, if you don't know why that rule works, then just knowing it, sometimes that's, that's not very helpful, right? Okay, so that's the second algebraic habit of mine. And then the third one, like I said, was abstracting from computations. Abstracting from computations. Well, how do we do that? How do we get people to do that in the classroom? Um, and how are you going to do it for me? Because that's where we're headed. How can I get you to abstract stuff um, using just simple computations? And, of course, one of the ways is I can, I can do computational shortcuts. So one of the very earliest forms of um, abstraction that students see in the math world is whenever they go from adding 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 that's a repetitive thing and they say hey there's a shortcut for that maybe that is four groups of two and so it becomes a multiplication problem and being able to see that shortcut and change it around will help them to be able to abstract. Now multiplication is a little more abstract idea than just adding two things together. Okay, Maybe they need to be able to calculate without computing. What? What does that mean? Again, see this example here? Sometimes whenever you're first teaching multiplication, they actually have to do in their heads 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. But sometimes whenever they're a little more focused, they've got a little more um, knowledge of their basic fundamental uh, multiplication rules and stuff like that, their times tables is what we used to call it whenever I was a kid. Okay, so then I know I don't have to do the computation, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. I know 4 groups of 2 is 8, man. So I can calculate that, and I don't have to write it down, and I don't have to do any actual computation in my head. So that's a generic thing, and I'm starting to abstract things instead of going, oh, man, let me add all that up, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. Okay. Can I generalize beyond a particular example. Okay, that's where we start getting, uh, it starts being a little bit more rough for the students, right? Generalizing beyond a particular example. So in other words, here I've got this very nice concrete kind of example here, and I wanna know, oh, does that work the same way all the time? So if I had, for instance, 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12. That's a different example, right? And can it apply to all kinds of things? Is that still 4 times 12? Can I change that into multiplication and can I generalize it? So does it have to be a 2 or a 12? What if I put in 4 times x? Oh my, that's a big thing, right? Okay, so generalizing beyond a particular example. Um, equivalent expressions, so similar thing. If somebody knows that 4 times 12 is equivalent to 48, then maybe I can change some stuff out and uh, do some substituting type stuff, and maybe I can um, 
can can help help myself be more abstract is what I'm after. Okay, symbolic expressions using the math symbols in particular for us are useful here. Um, for instance, everybody who watched this knew what I meant when I said four parentheses 12, that that's a symbolic representation for four times 12. I didn't have to spell that out, but you had to some point in your life go from 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12 to four parentheses 12. Oh, that's four times 12. Oh, that's 48. So we're starting to build our way up and make things more and more abstract. And then again, just like in number two, um, the building rules of, of re to represent the functions, sometimes we have to start justifying. And in this case, we're justifying our shortcuts. So how do we know for a fact that these two things really are equivalent? And how can I show that as a student? All right. So that's what's going on in your textbook this week. So hopefully you've read all that. You should be done with uh, chapter one, quite frankly. You've had it for a while. I scanned it in a week ago, so you've had access to it. So hopefully everybody's done with chapter one, and you start moving on to chapter two pretty quickly. All right. So we have an in-class activity, of course, because we always do that. Um, this one is the GCF and the LCM. I'm going to scan this guy up into D2L so you'll have it. You can print it. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, and uh, you'll just have it available. If you look back, remember I think I said that you don't have to turn this one in, but it will be very good if you can complete it. So that would be useful to you because knowing what these things are is going to be very helpful. So let me just give you kind of a definition of GCF and LCM and we'll talk about how you can get each one. If you have other methods for getting each one, that's fine. I don't care, just as long as you can show your math. So GCF, everybody knows, hopefully that means, yep, greatest common factor. Okay, so what does that mean? That's the largest factor that all the numbers are divisible by. All the numbers in your problem are divisible by. Oop. Divisible by. There we go. Okay. So if I want, for instance, the GCF of, and I'm going to list them for you, and this is the notation that you'll see, 24 and 39, then what I need to do is I need to figure out what number is the largest possible number that will go in evenly to both 24 and 39. So that's what we mean by all the numbers in the problem. Here I have two numbers, but you could have three numbers in the parentheses or four numbers in the parentheses. So I need to know the biggest number that'll go evenly into both. Okay, so I need to find that out. So here's my example. GCF of 24 and 39. And what I would do is I would look at their factors and then I would see what they have in common and what's the biggest. So for me, I like to do the factor tree. 24 is two times um, 12 and 12 is two times six and six is two times three. So there are all my factors. So I've got two times two times two times three, prime factorization, right? Okay, and then 39, that one's actually a lot easier. That one's 3 times 13, right? Really easy factorization. So if I wrote those out, let me just write them for you. I don't think we need to necessarily, but just so you can see. This is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. 39 is 3 times 13. You can line them up pretty easily and probably see, hey, look, what they have in common here is a 3. It's actually the only common factor, but it is the biggest common factor also, right? So it's the largest. So their greatest common factor is a three. I'm gonna put it up there so we have it in all of our spots and we can see, oh, the greatest common factor between those two. So that's one way to do it. That's using the prime factorization. So method number one, prime factorization. 
Method number two is you could just list out all the factors and see, okay, which one's the biggest. So they don't have to be the prime factors. They can be all the factors. Some people like to do that. I usually do prime factorization. But you could do that, list all the factors. So let's do that really quickly. 24's factors would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. There are a lot of them. It's pretty abundant looking there to me. 39 would be 1, 3, 13, and 39. So again, we can see, look right here, the thing that they have in common is a 3. If there had been, for instance, if this had been a 13 up here, then they would both have 13 in common. That would be the largest one. So I would have picked that one instead. Okay, But that's GCF. That's how I would find it. One of those two methods is probably your method. Again, if you have a different way you want to do it, that's fine by me. All right, so what about LCM? LCM means, yep, least common multiple. Okay, so again, the multiple is the thing that things go into. So divide into. So smallest number that is um, divisible. by all the rest of the numbers. Okay, and again, I don't want zero here because zero would be boring, right? So it's the smallest number that is divisible by all the rest of the numbers and we don't want zero. Okay, so let me do that. Um, again, there's a couple of methods. One is the prime factorization method. So let me write that first this time. Method number one, prime factorization. And again, I'm going to list out um, all the prime factorizations, and then I'm going to find the common one and multiply, and then multiply by terms that are not in common. So multiply all common factors and then multiply multiply by anything that's not common. Okay, so this one's a little bit more tricky on how you find it, but it's not terrible, so we'll see how that goes. All right, I've already got my prime factorization from earlier, so I'm not gonna redo that. We're just going to use it and go. So 24 we knew was 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And 39 we knew was 3 times 13. Again, their common factor was a 3. So what I need to know here is the LCM, least common multiple, of these two numbers is the common factor goes in there, but we just write it once because it's going to be overlapping here. So I just want it once. So it's three times, and then everything else goes in there. So a two times a two times a two times a 13. All of that stuff goes in there. And when I multiply that out, I get 312. Okay. So that is the one way. Method number two for this. would be to list all the multiples and just see where they finally come together. I actually don't really care for this one because it can get kind of out of hand really quickly. So I usually use um, the first method there. But multiples of 24, I don't want to come up with them all. Um, I wrote them down earlier, 24, 48, 72, 96, 120, 144, 
264, 288, 312. And we know that's it, so I'm going to stop. But you could keep going. You see why I don't love that. <laughs> okay. And then multiples of 39. Not quite as bad, but they're still pretty bad. 39, 78, 117, 156, 195, 234, 273, and 312. So you just keep on going listing out all the multiples of each number until you get one that they have in common. But you can see that that one's kind of a, a mess for doing it. Okay, so those are the two kind of standard ways that most people have done these before. I'm going to throw out one more, and it's actually a method for both. Hopefully you've seen this from um, your math ed classes. I like it a lot. It's the Venn diagram method. I'm going to give you a hint. I like it a lot. I think I said that just a second ago. So in case there let be any doubt, I like it a lot. So if I were you, I'd put a star or two in there. Maybe highlight this. Make sure you can do some of these because they're going to be important as we go forward. I don't know. Maybe in a quiz or something. So it's probably coming up. All right. The really cool part about this is if I use the Venn diagram, I can do everything we've already done in one Venn diagram. So if you've never loved Venn diagrams before, then maybe um, this will change your mind a little bit. You can find the common prime factors. Those are going to be placed in the center. So, hey, that gives me my GCF. That's nice. And then I'm going to take all the uncommon factors, if that's a word for here. Uncommon. Not in common. That's what we mean by that. Prime factors. And I'm going to put those in each of the um, outside circles. Place those in their respective circles, depending on which number it's a factor of. Okay, and the really cool thing is that I will get in the middle is the GCF. It's the product of the center numbers or the overlap in my bin and then I'll get the LCM which will be the product of everything all the numbers as long as we are down to prime factorizations we'll get that so it's really cool how this works out so if you want to do the one we already did, you can go for it and try a Venn diagram. I'm going to try a little bit different example because I want one that's going to have more than just one number in the center. So I'm going to find, I'm going to use a Venn diagram. To find um, LCM and GCF. of 36 and 48. Okay, so those are my numbers. So first thing I need to do, I need to get my prime factorizations. So 36, I know that that's the same as um, 9 times 4. And I know 9 is the same as 3 times 3. Those are my berries. And 4 is the same as 2 times 2. So that one's pretty good. And then I know 48 is... 4 times 12, and I know that 4 is 2 times 2, 12 is 3 times 4, and 4 is 2 times 2, okay? So I'm going to lift out the prime factorizations. 36 is 3, oh, I'm sorry, 2 times 2 times 3 times 3, or you could write 2 squared times 3 squared, but I'm just going to multiply them all out. And 48 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. Four twos and a 3 in there. Yep. Alright. I don't think I'm going to get as far as I had planned today. Darn. 
I know that's a sad day for you guys, but that's all right. We'll get through with LCM for sure. All right, so let's place these real quickly. My time is running out that I have placed on myself to do these things. I like to say over here is the number 36 and over here is the number 48, just so that I remember these things. I'm gonna scoot it up. And I wanna see what do they have in common? Well, I'm gonna look like I did before. There's a two and a two and there's a three. So there's a two and a two and a three. Those all go in the center. That's what they have in common. And then the 36, what does he still have left over? Yep, he has a three, so I'm gonna put that in the 36 circle. And the 48 still has a two and a two left over, but I know that's gonna be four, right? So I can kind of do that math real quickly. For their GCF, like I said before, the GCF is gonna be whatever's in the overlap, so it's two times two times three. But we know that that's, sorry about that, four times three, so that's 12. All right, think about it for a second. 36 and 48, yep, they're both divisible by 12, so that makes sense. That's cool. And then the LCM of those two, you're going to take all the common things, which I already had. There's, there's 12, 2 times 2 times 3, and then you're going to multiply anything that's left over. There was a 3, another 2, and another 2. So let's go. That was 12, right, that I had in the center times three times, and can I make that a four? Two times two is four. So this is 12 times 12, and we know that 12, 12, 12 times 12 is 144. So their LCM is 144. Okay. One more thing. There's a really cool formula. The LCM of two numbers if you notice, whenever these things are in the center, they're overlapping, I don't double count them. If you double count them, you'll get the wrong numbers here. I want to only count them once. That's why I only put them together right there once. Okay. So there's a really cool formula that says, hey, if you want your LCM, what you can do is you can multiply your A times your B, and then you can divide out the GCF. Because again, I don't want to double count. So you can do that real quickly, check it and see the LCM of 36 and 48 would be 36 times 48, but I'm going to divide out the 12 because that's the GCF. And if I just kind of pay attention here, the 36, or I'm sorry, the 12 goes into the 48 four times and it goes into the bottom once. I'm sorry, y'all can't see that one four times and it goes into the bottom once. There we go. And then I just have to multiply 36 times four. So six times four is four, carry the two. Three times four is 12 plus the two is 144. Lo and behold, look at that, it really does work. So it's a really cool fast formula for doing this. It might help you, all right. So as you go through, what you're going to do is you're looking at the GCF and the LCM. GCF and LCM. You can use that formula sum if it helps you, and you can see how this develops inside of this handout. So um, I actually just changed my mind. I'm sorry. I know that I said that the GCF, you're not going to have to turn that in. But because we didn't get very far, I'm totally out of time. I'm going to not give you the building with toothpicks and the exploring houses, and I'm going to give you this for your homework instead. So hold on to the building with toothpicks and the exploring houses. You won't have to worry about that. I'll make a note in D2L so that you know. So you won't be confused, hopefully. Don't worry about that stuff. Do the GCF and the LCM to turn it in, and I'll make sure to send um, that through the announcements. All right? Well, probably in the week two module, I'll make it there. Okay. Um, I think that's everything that I can possibly squeeze in right now because I already did a 20-minute video and now I'm shooting at a 40-minute video. So that's an hour's worth of videos for day two. So I feel like that's enough. I'm sorry. I had planned to do a little bit more stinkers. 
So we will do our problem solving stuff next time. And I'll start us out with a, a hands-on activity. Don't fence me in. And maybe we'll do some of that building with toothpicks together. All right. Y'all have a good week. Let me know if you have questions. Thanks.